In the fall of 2016, like a lot of uh, you, I was watching the presidential campaign with rising horror on both sides. People were saying things that were kind of crazy. And um, after the election, my wife is a very prominent immigration attorney. And she got a call from a general counsel at one of the Fortune 100 companies. And he said, what can we do? And I thought, oh, that's great. And I thought, what can I do? And so I wrote this very impassioned letter to about 20 or 25 friends who are economists and said, you know, we've got to do something. We should like make a website or something and talk about things and, and, and crickets. And then I remember, oh yeah, I'm writing to economists. So then I wrote this much more measured letter and um, we launched Econofact in January of 2017. We launched it with 20 economists and six memos. And I'll talk about what the memos are. Basically, I was, um, I was a chief economist at, uh, in International Affairs at Treasury in 2010 to 2011. And my first day there, I asked my boss what I should be doing. And he said, well, you're smart. You'll figure it out. I doubted both parts of that proposition at that point. But I decided my comparative advantage was doing research. So I wrote these short memos. And then when I went back to Fletcher, where I teach, which is a graduate school of international affairs, I thought it'd be very useful for our students to learn how to write these kinds of memos, because in the working world, you're not going to write academic papers. So I did that, and I came to Econofact with the idea of I could get my colleagues and friends to write memos like this, and we could post them on our site, and then they'd be a public resource. So we launched in January 2017. We're nonpartisan. We spend a long time editing each memo to make sure that there's no sort of political cant to it. Um, it's written by, now we have a network of more than 90 economists from across the country. Um, we're trying to provide very even-handed analysis where we draw on historical examples, economic analyses, statistics, and facts. They're sh relatively short memos, anywhere from 800 to 2,000 words. And they're jargon-free. We try to make them as accessible as we can to a very wide audience. So the website is www.econofact.org. I passed out on a number of tables a handout about that. This is what the landing page looks like. There is the, um, the newest memo is, is prominently uh, displayed. This is by Katie Russ, who is at UC Davis and the cost of tariffs imposed since 2008. She did a survey of the literature on that. Then the next three most recent memos are along the left side. Um, Dan Sickle at Wellesley wrote about why is inflation so low. I did a series of videos. This one was also with Dan Sickle about what is GDP measure. And then uh, another video with a friend of mine at Tufts, Dan Richards, about antitrust policy in the age of big tech. On the right side, we have a new thing we call data point, 80 to 1. This is um, a statistic that Katie came up with in a different memo from independent research. The ratio of jobs in the United States that use steel as opposed to make steel is 80 to 1. That's a really striking statistic. This was, for a while, our most cited memo, and Katie got interviewed a lot on the news about this. Um, and then we have uh, on that lower right bar box, um, by topic, you can t uh, touch one of those, uh, click on one of those, and get topics on a wide range of things. So, oh, also I should say, what we post on the website is a very short form of the memo. If you click on where it says read more, or if you click on um, the title, you get to the full memo. We have these search categories. We also have a search box at the top on the right where you can type in a person's name or a keyword and it'll bring you to the list of memos that include that. This is um, the Econofact network, so we have all the people uh, in the network listed there and it hyperlinks to the articles that they've written. Um, there's a very wide range of schools represented by the people in our network. There's a very wide range of areas of specialty. Um, we cover quite a few different kinds of things on the website. Um, we've been fortunate lately, we've g been getting a lot of attention. This is just a partial list of places where our memos have been cited and where our network economists, because of those memos, have been interviewed, um, and that's been growing. 
just very recently, starting in August, the PBS NewsHour is now on a pretty regular basis posting our memos on their site under their Making Sense category of economics. So the way the memos are written is that there is a structure to all of them. We start out with what is the issue, and then we have the facts uh, and bullet points, and we end with what this means. The way that we um, do this is we get an initial draft from a contributor, and then our managing editor, Miriam Wasserman, who lives in Ann Arbor and is a former economic journalist, former student of mine as well, she and I can spend anywhere from two hours to 12 hours on a memo, making sure that it's clear, that it's accessible, that everything is backed up. You'll see there are a lot of hyperlinks in the memos, that it's nonpartisan. And then with the author's OK, we post it on the site. Um, in this structure, it's like the inverse of a op-ed. An op-ed starts out, this is what I think should be done, and then it defends it. This starts out, this is what the issue is, here are the facts. And then, then at the end, we allow the authors to sort of say, what do they think? But only after establishing that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, background. So just to turn a little bit to how this is useful for teaching, this is a syllabus I'm working on right now for a macro half course that I'm teaching. And all the blue, um, all the blue there are hyperlinks to Econofact memos that I'll be using in this course. Here's an example of a memo. So as you may remember, in the run-up to the election, Peter Navarro was saying, um, or also known, what's his other name? Rob? Ron, Ron Varro, right. Well, one of them said that um, the trade deficit is a drag on growth. And I know this because I have a PhD in economics and Y equals C plus I plus G plus net exports. So if net exports is lower, therefore Y is lower. And every economist in the country went, oh, no, oh, no. And, but then they thought, oh, this is a great exam question. So a friend of mine, Menzi Chin, and I wrote this about, is it in fact true that a trade deficit is a drag on growth? So we wrote this memo. Basically, it's summarized in this, that the best way to bring the trade deficit into balance is have a deep financial crisis and the biggest downturn since the 1930s. Because that's when the trade deficit in the last uh, few years came closest to being in balance. So it's just, you know, it's a ridiculous argument but it's something where somebody with only a little bit of knowledge, and the aphorism, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing, is here, said, oh yeah, that seems right. And then we show, in fact, that's neither true in theory nor in practice. So Macmillan is now partnering with us. And what will happen is on, in their online sapling system, they're going to be featuring our memos. Our memos are completely you know, free and public access. But they're going to be including with the memos um, questions and analysis that you can then use in class if you're using one of their principles books. So for example, um, they did one for that memo I did with Menzi. And the, it comes in a way in which you know, it becomes increasingly more challenging as you go through the questions. So the first question um, you know, is just what is the definition of a trade deficit drag according to, um, to Navarro? And then the next question sort of goes through some things that you would learn in national income accounting. And then, um, then you talk about sort of a macroeconomic model and would you in fact get a trade deficit drag. So this is something where students using Econofact posts will see the link between what they're learning in class and what they're reading about in the newspaper. So when I was in college, I was an economics major and this was in the late 70s, and we were learning sort of ISLM, and there wasn't a lot of link to you know, what was going on with very, very high inflation. So I used to hitchhike to school, and people would ask me, what do you major in? And I would say economics, and they'd say, well, what about, you know, and they'd ask me about the high inflation. You know, we didn't learn about aggregate supply at that time, and I didn't know. So then I started to lie to people, and when they asked me what I majored in, I said theology. So it seemed <laughs> a lot easier to, just to talk about that. So these questions become you know, increasingly more challenging, and they start to bring in the FRED database. So this is a really rich teaching tool, I think, where the students who are learning all these wonderful tools see how they apply to very timely things. Now, economic textbooks are only revised every three years or so. We publish one or two memos a week. So there's a, a continuing rich resource here 
that Macmillan is going to be able to draw on. So, some examples. Um, in microeconomics, we have a very nice uh, post by Jonathan Meir, who benefits from a higher minimum wage. When people talk about there's a lot of consensus in economics, I think minimum wage is one of the things where there's less consensus. So Jonathan points out that there are many um, dimensions along which a job can change, and if you pay a higher minimum wage, you might take away some benefits or force people to work harder, or things like that. Gib Metcalf, my um, colleague at Tufts, and who was also my colleague when I was at Treasury, wrote on carbon taxes, drawing from a very good uh, book that he just published. Macroeconomics, Karen Dynan, who is the chief economist at Treasury, and Miriam, our, um, our uh, managing editor, wrote a nice piece explaining how do you read the employment report. Um, Ken Kuttner at Williams wrote about uh, basically the Taylor Rule and showing if you look at the Taylor Rule, and this was recently updated, the federal funds rate should be like 5%. So, you know, talk about the Fed being strangling off the economy is clearly not correct. International economics, Lee Brandstetter at Carnegie Mellon uses the example of the trade restrictions on Japanese cars in the 1980s and how they didn't work. Uh, Maury Opsfeld and I wrote about whether or not the dollar should be, um, you know, there should be efforts to weaken the dollar. Uh, not surprisingly, perhaps to many of you, the answer that we come up with is no. Uh, public finance, Bill Gale at Brookings, who has a very nice new book called Fiscal Therapy, um, is drawing from that to write a number of memos for us, um, and one about the uh, deficits and the debt. Kim Clausing at Reed wrote about um, taxing the rich. Um, and then labor economics, uh, Amy Shin, who's a sociologist, and Francesc Ortega at Queens wrote about why are undocumented workers paid less. And then Fran Blau and Larry Kahn at Cornell wrote about why do women continue to make less than men. So there's a very rich set of things. We by now have more than 190 memos, and we have about 20 videos, and we're going try to increase the number of those as well. So I really like this paper. This is by Ray Fisman at Boston University and Eric Zitowitz. What they did is immediately after the election, they looked at what happened to different stocks, which stocks rose and which stocks fell. And then they put those into sort of a Trump long and a Trump short category, and they followed what happened to that differential over time. And what you found was that as the Trump administration in its early years sort of um, seemed to fail, then that would go one way. When it seemed to succeed, it would go another. And it's a great example of how do financial markets work? How are they forward looking? What is the news content effect on stock prices? This is um, the memo I mentioned by Katie Russ and um, L Lydia Cox, who's a graduate student at Harvard. And they looked at um, US industries that use steel in production as opposed to ones that make it. And they had a heat map for that. And they also then came up with this figure of 80 to 1. As I mentioned, lots of news organizations picked up on this. This had the um, good fortune of coming out just as Trump was announcing the steel tariffs. So it got a lot of attention. And then her most recent post about tariff, the costs of tariff, how much is borne by US households, the answer is somewhere between $500 and $1,700 a year. That just came out as a new round of tariffs is coming out. So Katie turns out to be really good in her timing. Mark Mellitz at Harvard and I wrote one about international supply chains, drawing on some uh, research of, of other economists. It turns out that if you take into account that, for example, an iPhone that comes to the US from China, a certain uh, vintage of iPhone, it costs $225 wholesale. How much of that do you think was actually value added in China? Any guesses? Half of that, five. So bilateral trade statistics. Mark, as you know, is one of the foremost trade theorists in the world. And when he was interviewed about this um, on PRI's The World, uh, Jason Margolis, the interviewer, asked him, so how much information should we uh, you know, uh, gain from bilateral trade statistics? And Mark's answer was none. And it's just a pause. So it was really a very powerful statement. And this, you know, is based on this kind of research, and we, we post this here. Fran Blau um, was a co-author of a National Academy of Science study about the cost of immigration, which was completely misquoted by the administration. So 
she was so outraged that she wrote this post with Gretchen Donhauer. The, um, the green line is the US children born of US parents. And this is the cost of, um, the fiscal cost of them. And as you would think over their life cycle, it's different. The dotted line is the cost of immigrants. And you see that it's below that. The red line is the US children with at least one immigrant parent. So I'm in that category. And that's higher. So if you think multi-generationally or over the life cycle, this idea that immigrants are costing the United States is just dead wrong. And finally, Amanda, Amanda Agin at Rutgers and um, Jennifer Doliak did this really interesting thing about ban the box, where people no longer had to uh, say whether or not they, were, um, they had been convicted of a felony in a job application. And what they found was that there was a sort of a deep racial um, animus here where um, black applicants were sort of assumed to be more likely to have been convicted of a felony. And you know, this thing that was supposed to help people actually ended up hurting people. This is like the kind of examples, unintended consequences that we as economists just love. So to conclude, I think this is a very useful teaching tool. I, I use it a lot in class. I know a lot of people who are using it in class. And it's going to be even more useful as Macmillan makes a set of things that can go with it and make it even more useful for your class. Even before that, feel free to use it. Um, and finally, you might be interested in contributing as well in the research that you do, in some of the interesting things that you teach. For example, I have one on, that's called Leaning on the Fed that has gotten a lot of attention about why do we think central bank independence is important. So I've done a little research on that, but basically it's based on my teaching. I have another one. What's the cost of, or why are we worried about low inflation? So I haven't really done a lot of monetary economics, but you know, at the level where we're talking to a very broad audience, what you teach in class is really valuable. And Miriam and I will work with you if you want to contribute to help shape the memos. And it's been something where it's been really rewarding for us, and I think for the people who do this for us, who are contributors, are doing it not for any pay, but out of a sense of civic engagement, because now more than ever, we really need the voice of economists and the advice of economists and the ideas of economists to be out there in the public sphere. And if you ever tried to publish an op-ed, you know it's very difficult in a lot of walls. This is a very low cost way for you to get your knowledge out there. And increasingly, this is becoming the narrow part of a big megaphone where we're getting picked up by, um, by journalists and it's getting a lot more attention. So this is basically what I've been doing the last two and a half years instead of research, but I'm old, it's okay. Um, but it's been very rewarding too and perhaps some of you would like to join us. In that.